Welcome, everybody, to Learn With Lowell. I'm your host, Lowell, a serial entrepreneur, sharp advisor, and your host for the show. Every week, we talk to scientists, artists, and experts from around the world. Today, we're joined with someone from Cologne, Germany, really far away, really late in the night, Bjorn Schumacher, who is the principal investigator and chair for Genome Genome Stability and Aging and Disease at the Institute of Genome Stability and Aging and Disease. Well-named title and well-named place. Or I just accidentally said it uh, twice when I was writing stuff out. Uh, just remember to subscribe, check things out. It tells the Google guys this is something worth uh, checking out. Bjorn, welcome to the show, and thanks for taking the time to talk with us about your work. Thanks for having me. Sweet. So, jumping right in, and the links to his research will be, to your research will be in the show notes, just so like people can really get the meat of this conversation. How, how does your research into DNA repair mechanisms differ from other approaches, like just on a high level um, in aging associated diseases like cancer and other things? Like how, what is basically your special sauce as it relates to the field of aging and DNA repair and damage? So we really want to go at the bottom of what causes aging. And there are human um, syndromes, very severe genetic diseases where already children age. Within the first decade of life, not even being teenagers, they all already have the appearance of old people and develop age-related diseases very prematurely. They die before their teens of neurodegeneration, atherosclerosis, and these typically age-related diseases. What's the underlying cause for that? It's defects in DNA repair. They have, some, they have a single gene mutation in DNA repair, which accelerates the entire aging process. And that tells us that DNA damage is really a fundamental driving factor of the aging process. And that's why I decided to study DNA damage. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the, the moment that you first were exposed to this idea that you wanted to, that made you wanted to spend so much of your life on? Do you remember like what was the what was the thing that like tips you over to say like this is something I want to spend so much time so so, so much of your life on it? So that happened actually already in high school in biology class mm. because because being exposed to the idea that we are aging but we have no idea why and particularly mm. at that time there was no that all this thriving modern biology of aging field so uh, that really intrigued me that there was an issue that we humans are all subject to that we don't understand. And so there are really two points that on the one side, a fascinating problem in biology yet unresolved. And on the other side, a really important factor of human existence and of all these chronic diseases that sooner or later, most of us, probably all of us at some point uh, will suffer from. And so that really intrigued me since then I decided I, I will study biology. And during the course then of, um, of, of being a master's student, a PhD student, then I decided to really go into DNA repair and really study that problem specifically. So that's, I think when people hear about getting your PhD, master's, all this work, and they think, you know, I think it's like 12 extra years out of high school to do that stuff. There's a lot of times where you're like, man, you know, maybe this isn't for me or anything like that. Like there's so many options to like veer off and do something else. Is there an aspect of biology or research in particular that gets you really excited? Is it the problem solving aspect of it? Is it the fact that it affects real world uh, people? Is there so when it's like stressful, when it has uh, when you have all these things going on, what are the elements of your work that really gets you excited? That keeps you going? Well, it was What's really fascinating about biology is the more you understand, the more you see that you don't know. And mm. it's an it's an ever evolving field. And there are no limits to that because what we know nowadays of biology is probably only really the tip of the iceberg. There are so many unexplored mechanisms. Today there, there are completely new avenues of research that we are exploring. And so this happens all the time that you, you, you start wondering how a process, let's say program cell death, for example, how does it work? And then you find the very first genes. And then the more you know, you, you investigate it, you find how, how it is embedded in the entire complexity of a cell, then from a cell to the tissue, to the organ, to the organism. 
and you you find more and more complexity and it doesn't doesn't end it's not that uh you've you've uh, finished your project and now you understood the entirety of a, of a complex no you uh, you have you have a lot more questions to ask and so this is this is what's really exciting about being a scientist that it's not that you're fulfilling it to, uh, and completing some project no you are asking constantly you're inspired by new questions new ideas new new concepts and that's why science is always on the move it's it's so dynamic and so it really never ends there's a there's a, a website and I, I hope it's still up and i can find it to put it in the show notes but it started with a human and then it had like a you know like a like a, a dinosaur and then it went to like a, a an airliner and then the, the planet and then it went to the 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 sun and then it got to the point where like the sun was the size of a human and it kept getting bigger but like there's these things in the universe that just made us look like like not even a speck like the speck of a speck so you can go all the way up and see these massive scaled things that make even our sun seem small and the sun is like i think it's like 27 earths in width like that thing's big but it's not big as the things out there but you also go down and you'd go into the human and you go to the, the cells to the organs to even in the cells itself and it was just like each stage there was a whole universe like it's like when you go down it gets big when you go up it gets big like there's just so much complexity to life and hopefully i can find that because i think it represents what you're saying so well which is there's a lot of stuff going on and we're still exploring it the do you do you think we have i guess you can't know what you don't know but when you're doing your research, when you're having ideas and you want to test hypotheses, are are there things that you want to test that we just don't have the tools to assess for? Or do we have sufficient enough tools to research all the ideas that you currently have? Like, but that's like, it's kind of like, how do you prove a negative kind of, of a question? But do you have everything you need to answer every question you've ever thought of, I guess, in re reference to what we're talking about? So this is a very good question because we are obviously limited limited by the methodologies, by the technology that we have. And technology has driven science and science has driven technology. So that there are limitations. And I give you a, a, a very important example, particularly in regard to aging research. So what we do in biology is usually that we're trying to use model organisms. Model organisms are animals that are established in the lab and they can be you know cultivated under under standard conditions and we we know them so well that we can study a lot of things so for example the nematode has been really the workhorse of aging research it lives three weeks so you know within a, a phd thesis work you can actually do some real aging and longevity experiments um and uh and 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 you have drosophila and you have um, uh, you, you have some vertebrate species like uh, the killifish nowadays, uh, naked mole rat is coming up. The mice have a very uh, important uh, role here. And then the question is, can you transfer that to humans? Of course, biological processes are usually very highly conserved. So yes, so the mechanisms are all there, all these things. But one big limitation is that there's a lot of diversity and aging in humans. For example, every each one of us has some variants of the human genome. Each one of us has their individual trajectories that epigenetically alter our the way we are aging individually. There's probably nothing more personal for us than the way we age. Even identical twins age differently from each other. Although at the beginning of their lives, nobody can tell them apart except themselves. And this is not mirrored in model organisms. The mice we study, they are specific strains. They're inbred strains just because we need to have a similar comparable genetic background. They live under identical environmental conditions. And now to transfer that to humans, that's a major challenge we are facing in mm. aging research when you bring it to the clinic. And here comes exactly a limitation because we have way too little data on humans. And we know way too little about the aging trajectory of humans in, in the context of our individual genetic makeup, in the context of our in, individual epigenetic um, uh, trajectories in our in environmental interactions in our in, in with the complex environment that we are living in, which we cannot currently model 
in any of our model organisms. So that there are clear limitations indeed. If you could prioritize the, if you if you had the ability to pick all the data you can get from a human, and you had to prioritize the 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 tops the top amount that you would just want to focus on at, at the beginning. What data do you think would have that we could collect on people, bio samples, whatever that would that you think would give a great representation of people as they age, so we could have better research? Oh, the 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 methodologies for that are amazing, and they allow non-invasive almost hmm. um, to generate human data. For example. Um, Epigenetic clocks, a major breakthrough driven by Steve Horvard in, in aging research that the aging process can be quantified. The age of an individual can be measured. And this can be taken by a mouth swap. Um, mm. Completely non-invasive. You can do all the epigenetics with that. You can also do all the DNA um, uh, sequencing analysis with with uh, uh, just just a swab, and uh, so that's non-invasive and gives you already a lot of information. In addition, you can, for example, take blood samples um, that that are, you know, a minor in in, in invasion. So where where you can generate again a, a more complex data set. You can look at different blood cells. You can look at uh, transcription data, RNA sequencing data, where you can look at gene activity. And we have developed, for example, an epigenetic clock that's based on a blood sampling with gene activity measurements that is that is is very accurate and gives you a plethora of information because you know now the activity of every individual gene in your blood. And so you can already sample a lot of things of, from humans without any major invasive uh, um, uh, procedure being required. Hmm. Do you would you need like a medical record to go with the donations or like a mouth swab, or could you just have like an assembly line of people like running through like a marathon, just like let me just swab your cheek and like run through it, or would you need like hey I'm Lowell I'm this age this way those types of details as well to make sense of it? The more data the better because then mm -hmm. you can connect things. So for example, what is what is it, what is a, a very important connection is, for example, can you connect it to individual disease risk? So we all know that we're getting sick when we are old, but each one has a different combination of disease, um, it has, has different vulnerabilities. Um, so to predict that would be tremendously helpful. And so, of course, the more data you assemble also with medical records, um, the more you can make out of it, the more risk factors, for example, uh, you you can you can identify, and particularly what wh where you want to get this to is that you can actually assess the success of interventions. So, for example, mm -hmm. we know some interventions that are just lifestyle interventions that can have a tremendous effect, but you have to measure and quantify to which degree it has which effect on an individual human, mm -hmm. and that you can do with these type of tests. Um, provided that you really gather enough data and we need really clinically controlled data from cohorts of humans so that you really can have um, you know the entire as much data integrated so that you identify novel links to aging trajectories to disease risk and to the success of, of intervention strategies. Yeah uh, I've long thought that in the U.S., we have blood dryers. They just go around in like these big trucks, and people just come up, donate blood. I've long felt that there should just be an extra little box that you tick, and you could and just like, yes, I want my 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 biomaterial, or whatever, to be used for these this research as well. So not only can they save a life, but potentially they could save they could you know be a part of research as well. I think they I don't think there's any mechanism right now that allows that, but I've I've long felt that that'd be an amazing just like people are already there wanting to help like like let them have a bo box check and maybe they get like i don't know a coupon or something i don't know how we comp you know incentivize people but i'm sure there's a way to do that if they're already interested i think this is very important to do and it just has to be clear that this has to be for the sake of of research and for the better of humanity it should be yeah. protected from any misuse be it by employers or insurance companies or all these things so there should be really no negative effect associated with that um, and so we really need a lot of trust in such a system, and it has to be really accessible 
um, to research. That's that's really essential for that. Hmm. Is there uh, so I'm not a researcher. So I don't know how you you go about getting data. Is that if it if such a process did exist, how could what would be the most optimal way to make sure that you get access to that data? Is it just like a a license you get and then they give you the database? I I, I literally I don't do this type of research. I'm just kind of curious how it would actually work to be optimal for researchers. So the United States, the NIH is really a fantastic place that uh, that can take could take care exactly of these kind of endeavors. Mm. Also with the give, giving access to researchers around the world to that. Um, so the NIH has such, uh, some of such initiatives um, where uh, databases are generated that can be really used for uh, for research. So I think the NIH is the natural place for doing that. Uh, some kind of Scandinavian countries are very far advanced with these kind of approaches of uh, collecting medical records and making them accessible. Denmark, for example, is 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 very progressive in this regard. Um, and uh, what what is, however, the challenge is that if it's just in contrast, then with commercial enterprises that use these data for profit, then it becomes very difficult. So. It should be really in the hands of the scientific community um, and they established um, public institutions that can really make sure that this is uh, this is used for the greater good. Yeah, I think the I was reading the other day that the guy who figured out insulin, he gave the patent up for a dollar because he thought no one should have to pay money. And then the, in the US, mm-hmm. uh, for people not in the US, there are people there are people price gouging insulin to the point where people couldn't afford to live and people were dying and i think they're still dying from it and they're, they're starting to put in uh, controls on it now but from going from one dollar trying to do something good and just trusting that people would not use it i think yeah like you're saying like the scientists unfortunately because of people like this have learned we gotta have you gotta have to you have to have a hand on it to make sure that it's taken care of in the right ways or else you know someone who wants to make like way more than a dollar is gonna you know take advantage which which is really unfortunate when someone invent something and so purely just wants to give it up so that no one has to suffer that way to have it twisted like i can't even imagine what that feel like to that scientist um so i'm all for this type of stuff and i, I hopefully more people you know i don't think anyone's against it I, other than the companies I, and at the same time i bet the people at the companies are like why, why am i doing this it's like oh for a paycheck so but everyone's always made a it's like a nesting doll of, of people at the end of the day um are there places in the world that seem to be leading the charge on longevity is um I know America spends a lot of money on research. I think that's like the big thing we do. We just love spending money. <laughs> that's like one of our our, our, our our things. But when it comes when you're when you're reading and you're and you have uh, and you're able to see the advancements coming out, is are they coming out of certain areas in particular around the world? Well, yes, of course. the The United States is a is a is a leader in the scientific uh, in the scientific world. Um, it's also a very large size. If you're saying that the United States spends a lot on research, I would contest that because hmm. it depends what you mean on spending a lot on research. Um, if you compare to uh, what other things are spent on, it's it's still very <laughs> minor. I mean, if you compare it to hmm. the defense budget, I think it's a, it's yeah. a joke what is actually uh, invested into research and into you know into the advancement of science that can really be so beneficial for humans and i find it scandalous that uh we have goals in uh in, of of spending three percent of the gdp in science and and development i think that's that's completely under ambitious uh mm-hmm. we we should have much more ambition to really invest into science that brings it has brought us so much advances. I mean, the life expectancy of nowadays, that's advances in hygiene and medicine. They were really driven by science, by understanding how pathogens work, how we can mitigate pathogens, protect us um, uh, and, and from, from adverse health effects, all these things. So it, it makes a tremendous difference. And it's also the driver of our economy is is uh, research education and 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 that is really driven by science so i think we should really reconsider what importance our society should uh, should really give to to science to uh, to research to education that is really the, the the fundamental basis for for our for our economy and for our well-being mm-hmm. the I think NASA 
in the United States, people always assume they have a big budget, but I think it's like 0.4%. It's like, it's nothing. They're really punching up in terms of their budget. They're able to do a lot. Um, But I I sometimes I wonder like how much money do, if we could just invest an unlimited amount of money to reach the threshold of of curing aging, like I wonder how much that would be, but you can't really know because there's like so much to do, right? There's uh, so much fundamental research left to do. one thing one thing I, I talked with Michael Levin, who recently was on, I asked him this question of like, wh- why is it that when cancer starts being its own thing in the body, why is it that it can be immortal? And he he changed the question, like, why is it that things are not always immortal, considering like they're like cancer cells are that way, ger- germline cells are that way. And so I'm wondering, um, I didn't ask him this question, but I'm, I'm excited to ask you this question, which is we, we in your in your research and, and generally people can can look this up as well. But uh, the germline is roughly immortal. I think Richard Dawkins wrote a book called "The Mortal the, the Mortal Gene" or "The Selfish Gene" or something like that. Um, what are the corrective mechanisms that allow it to be to last so long? I think in one of your talks you said that uh, roughly our, our our germline is like two hundred thousand years old, uh, or somewhere or somewhere around there, if I remember correctly. So what are right. what are some of the mechanisms that allow that to happen? So that's really the fascinating question, and that's really at the center of our current research to figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. Our uh, our, our germ cells are indeed indefinitely perpetuating. And as uh, modern Homo sapiens, they're 200,000 years old, and yet their ancestors go back way, way longer. So there are some mechanisms that that allows them to survive for generation and generation and generation. Um, And their immortality is also the reason of our own mortality, because once they are uh, they they are passed on to the next generation, and the next generation is now able to carry them on as well, we no longer matter to evolution. There's no reason anymore why we have no fitness uh, contribution anymore on the further fate of the of the human genome. So we are dispensable, disposable. Um, and so we can age and decay and die. And, and that's exactly this, this distinction. Why can germ cells do that, but our soma cannot? That is really the exciting question. And the answer to that is that there's a combination of two important mechanisms, at least. The one is the repair, the maintenance of the genomes in the germline that is just much more proficient than the maintenance of our somatic genomes. Because our somatic genomes just need to last for our individual lifespan, the germ, germline genomes are passed on. And so repair is an important aspect, but then also selection to make sure that whatever is selected for being the critical oocyte that is about to be fertilized in the end is really the right one. There are selection processes before. If there's damage, Early on in, in, in oogenesis, oocytes are eliminated before they, so that, that a, a, a damaged genome cannot be passed on. And so there's a, there's a very high degree of selection there. And the combination of these two processes ensures then that stable genomes are maintained for generation and generation. And what we are trying to do now is to take those this level of genome maintenance, of repair, and transfer to the somatic cells to give them germline-like repair abilities. And this is exactly what uh, where we have um, just recently um, uh, produced really the groundbreaking discovery of a master, such a master regulator that limits the repair ability of somatic genomes. I think the... The research they came out with is called the the dream complex, if I remember exactly. right. Exactly. So I had a I had a specific question regarding the dream complex, and I wrote it down so that I would get it right. So um, it's really great. Anyone who wants to like keep up to date, like go to your, your Twitter, which will be on the show notes, because you you actually talk and engage and get excited for this work. I think sometimes people forget that like scientists are people, and people get excited, and if they're working on something, I don't know. I, I love the I love actually like seeing the passion man things. So, but anyways, to quote. The worms with defective dream complex are extraordinarily resistant to every type of DNA damage we tested because they have now the efficient DNA repair uh, capacity Sorry, that normally only the germ cells have. So my question is, what benefit does the dream complex have, just on like, uh, and then we'll work through it, but what what benefits does the dream complex have that it normally handles 
that may be a concern when they're down regulated. So in it being down regulated, it's able to repair and do all these great things. But sometimes um, if something it, like, does it have a uh, function that once down regulated, like we need to be mindful of? Yeah, so that is that is obviously a very interesting question because if you could uh, improve somatic DNA repair, why, why on earth wouldn't you just do it? Uh, but instead, um, the dream complex is repressing repair in the somatic mm. cells, and we we looked at that. What could be could there be a trade off? Usually, there are trade offs in evolution, right? That you you you. Uh, um, if if you if you change one thing, you lose another thing, and so in evolution, it always is the most important output. How much progeny do you produce in which amount of time? And that's what we looked at, and we used the nematode, this workhorse of the aging field, C. elegans, to answer that question because it's much easier to do whole organism research. Um, and what we found there is that there's a slight reduction of the fecundity of these animals that lack a dream complex. So our interpretation is that there is a trade-off, there is a cost associated with now improving the maintenance of the soma, because normally you would de de uh, you would would uh, take resources from the soma to the germline to make sure that you produce as much offspring in as rapidly as you can. But now, because you you um, invest more into somatic DNA repair, you diverting now these resources, keeping them into the soma, and that is essentially what we propose is the trade-off. So there is a trade-off in an individual. You don't see much of that, but when you imagine that this goes on for generation after generation and generation, there would be a fitness. Um, disadvantage of having these high somatic repair capacities, which in the very short lifespan of such an animal, you wouldn't really need. It's just, you know, for for humans like us who now live way, way longer than in our evolutionary history, we really want to have that stuff. Mm -hmm. it, by, so uh, do you mean with fecundity, you mean like the, do you mean the cells and they're able to reproduce or is it? Oh, sorry. Or like sorry. people. Fecundity mean people? means just the number of offspring that are produced per individual and that is slightly lower. Oh, okay. So the, a, a potential trade-off would be like, maybe we have to do like IVF if it like has a similar effect in people. That would be extreme because in people you just invest much, much, much less relative from your resources for reproduction. Um, it's not comparable to what a what yeah. a uh, what what a simple worm invests relative from all its en energy expenditure into reproduction. And then uh, continue with the dream complex. How would you how do you expect to regulate? I think you're about to do mice, if I'm if, I, if I'm remembering right. But how do you? I guess we just go to the mice because I, I I was just thinking like how would you regulate that in humans? Like would it be? Uh, like a CRISPR gene therapy that would come in and you know basically downregulate it. Um, yeah, but let's just go with that. What? How? How would you uh, regulate this in humans? So we showed actually as a proof of concept, we inhibited a kinase that is responsible for assembling the dream complex, and that could produce the very same effect. We saw then a, an induction of DNA repair genes in human cells and resistance to different types of DNA damage. So as a proof of concept, that works. And based on that, we are now really poised to develop real therapeutic strategies that we can then implement initially in mice, where we also have some uh, produce some proof of concept that this works, um, and uh, then really go into, uh, into humans to improve DNA repair in humans and get all the beneficial effects. But with every therapy, of course, you have to um, you have to really work on the specifics of it to make sure it's safe, it can work effectively, and uh, it, it has then a really pronounced effect on enhancing genome stability. And this is exactly what we're working on now. The, is it your ambition when it's at that stage that the, you and the university would license it to a pharma company to take it the rest of the way? Or is it your intention to just keep going and actually form your own company of some kind to see it to that end? 
Yeah, so pharmaceutical companies are great to get something in the clinic at the very end and do the phase three trials and then do the do the marketing for you know getting your drug um, out there. Um, but they are not the 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 innovators that that develop yeah. the very new concepts, and that's why um, we we uh, are indeed planning to do that as a as a as a biotech uh, to really be innovative and take this completely novel approach that nobody has really been able to take ever before. Because for the first time, we have a master regulator. We cannot only activate one repair mechanism, but all of them. Because you have to imagine that DNA damage uh, co consists of hundreds of different types of DNA lesions, because every single cell uh, in our body experiences up to 100,000 DNA damaging events every single day of our life. And they can they, they come in a, in, a, in a wide variety of different types of damage. They require then distinct repair mechanisms, highly sophisticated mm. repair machineries. And we, for the first time, can now improve the function of all of them. And that's fundamentally new. Um, and that's why we are now really developing approaches to bring this completely new concept uh, into into a therapeutic setting. And it, it's so it sounds like because it's so upstream, the it has the capacity to hit so many things downstream. Um, I How long do you think it would be? I don't know how long it takes to do the, the mice research. Are we are we thinking like the next like five years, you this would be something you translate into uh, a, a startup to see it to the end? Or is this uh, like what's roughly the timeline that people can expect for to for your research? Yeah. So in in uh, in the uh, in, in in the current system of, of uh, medical research, um, you uh, need to go for specific diseases that you treat with that, and there are clearly age-related diseases that where the, the molecular causal link to DNA damage is absolutely clear, and uh, so you would go. For disorders, you would go for some of these progeroid syndromes, where, as I said at the very beginning, that because of a repair defect, the, the children age very rapidly, and it's very important that we find uh, therapies to help these children. Um, and so, this is a stepwise process of how you would then go into the clinic. The future, the future of medicine that we envision is that you prevent diseases, a future where you don't even get sick anymore because you prevent diseases by maintaining health, by maintaining function, by maintaining the genome, prevent damage, prevent disease, lower the risk factors of age-related diseases, and stay healthy. That's the future. The future is preventive medicine, and but that requires a paradigm change in medicine that uh, I hope that it will, will come. The sooner, the better. Um, currently, of course, it's about individual diseases. That's how our system is made. Um, but I think there's a, there, there, there's there's a lot of incentive right now to change that and really target health maintenance instead of mm. disease once it's there. Yeah. Are there so if there's diseases where this type of thing is a bad thing when it's you know not properly regulated are there populations of humans that we've seen that live a long time that happen to have uh this naturally a part of their system like the like the dream complex already downregulated so it's it's uh currently unknown because this is this mm. is very new um mm. of course the the dream complex is known for a long time to regulate uh cell cycle genes um but it's its inhibition is insufficient to itself uh, uh, bring cells into the cell cycle, so that's why we also believe that that it uh, could act it could could be be a very safe way um, uh, to really specifically uh, target this function um, of improving DNA repair. Um, but uh, there's a lot of unknown, unexplored, and uh, this is these are all things that we are looking at uh, and now that we know about this new and, and very exciting function of the dream complex. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Then what, so you talked about a minute ago how we go through a lot of uh, uh, DNA lesions and damage through just 
our n normal day, whether it's from the sun giving us a hug <laughs> or just our, our ambient environment. Uh, I think I think most things really give off some form of radiation, even like a desk or something. But what are some of the common DNA uh, when when there's uh, persistent DNA damage? Are there specific types that typically happen for people? The stuff that like, yeah, so maybe we're not able to repair as easily. Yeah. So I, I um, it's estimated that each cell, each genome in each cell every day um, experiences 100,000, up to 100,000 DNA lesions. Wow. And these are really coming from a variety of sources. So, our, so we know for a very long time that UV radiation, the UV spectrum of the, the sunlight, damages the DNA in our skin cells and, uh, that, and drives photoaging as well as skin carcinogenesis, right? And so we can protect ourselves from that. That's a very clear example of what you can do already nowadays, protect your skin from UV light. You have the same with uh, tobacco smoke. There are many ingredients in tobacco smoke that damage DNA and cause uh, not only lung carcinomas, but really a, a, a wide variety of age-related diseases are promoted by these genotoxins there. So stop smoking, prevent it. Um, then, however, there, is, there are endogenous types of genotoxins, of, of agents, chemicals that attack the DNA, and they can be generated during the very normal metabolism in our cells. Reactive mm. oxygen species, one example of that, but many, also many, um, in, many uh, uh, byproducts of our metabolism when we metabolize food and things like that, they are genotoxins that can, uh, that can be built during that process as a byproduct. So, and then there's spontaneous DNA damage. So very spontaneously, um, bases can be lost from the DNA, and this is inevitable. So there's a large part of inevitable DNA damage, and there's some part, particular environmental um, genotoxins that we really should get rid of. Um, so we can do a combination of, uh, of, of really mitigating at least already the, the, uh, the damage that comes from the outside. What the... What, like we were saying earlier, when you learn more about biology, it, it almost feels like a miracle that like we get to like we're around, we're able to do stuff, we're thinking creatures. Like you hear all the stuff that's going on under the skin that you don't have to think about. It, it honestly feels like a miracle sometimes when I'm when I hear about it. Uh, it's like a very beautiful system. But so this kind of relates to a fan listener question. So I, I think I'm going to grab that one. So the the name is Dan the Purple, which I assume is fine to say your name, Dan. Um, so this is the question. If I remember correctly, a previous paper of his, which po uh, posited DNA damage as the primary underlying cause of aging, included the lack of a known mass regulator of DDR as a weakness of the theory, as it made it difficult to test the effect of broad damages, sorry, broad changes in DDR on aging. The implication here seems to be that they predicted that a that a use that using a mass regulator to upregulate DDR would be a clear and testable impacts on aging. Yet in their paper, where they posit that the dream complex is a mass regulator of DNA damage repair, none of the worms they tested on showed any form of increased lifespan, even the UV bombardment control cases. Uh, how do you reconcile the differences? And I can re re read it again, because sometimes I'm like mildly dyslexic and I wonder how I read things. So maybe I can explain uh, what we found in terms of lifespan. So yeah. In C. elegans, uh, in contrast to humans, just a defect in DNA repair is insufficient to accelerate aging. In humans, we know one defect in the DNA repair genes greatly accelerates aging, 10 times sometimes. In worms, we require DNA damage from the environment, probably because it's so short-lived. So we need to apply DNA damage. And then we accelerate aging just the same way that endogenous DNA damage in humans accelerates aging. So we need this, uh, this, this DNA damage from the outside. Then aging is accelerated. Then we have the DNA damage driven aging that we are worried about as far as humans so much. And when then we have a mutation in any component of the dream complex, 
the lifespan is greatly ex uh, extended under these hmm. conditions. So DNA damage driven aging can be effectively um, antagonized and overcome by inhibiting the dream complex and improving DNA repair. So I think there, there, there might have been some misunderstanding in the interpretation of the uh, this experiment. And hmm. I, I'm, I was happy to clarify that. Yeah. How how much longer do the worms live when it, when you're applying the dream complex? Do they live like a little bit longer or? Yeah, so it's it's highly significant the the extension of the of the lifespan that we find. Um, it, it's really a tremendous effect. Yeah. Um, then in, so another uh, question related to your work, uh, like uh, um, I mentioned before we started rolling that a lot of you uh, wrote in and asked questions. And if you're if you're a subscriber and you ask a question, uh, it goes to the top. So, but uh, in terms of DNA damage, and this is enough concentrate. People have the weirdest names, like in terms of like what they put their their side names are. But in terms of DNA damage, what is the difference between younger and older people? And when does he suppose restoration will be become practical? I think we we addressed practical, but is there a difference? between uh, dam DNA damage and DNA damage repair in a young person versus an old person? There's a longstanding debate about that. And uh, there, there are, uh, it, it is possible that there is declining DNA repair ability with aging. Um, the clearest uh, evidence we know for this is that a measure of DNA damage is the accumulation of somatic mutations. Because mutations are one of the outcomes of DNA damage. So some of the damage can result in mutations. And mutations now you can measure very, very accurately by DNA sequencing. And that, there have been great advances in recent years where it was indeed shown that the rate of somatic mutations increases with age. And that's a clear indication that indeed there's, there's waning DNA repair abilities over the course of aging in humans. Um, so then there are also a lot of um, uh, reports on, on DNA damage accumulation in the context of dementias, of neurodegeneration, um, and just with natural aging. Uh, so there's really a whole body of evidence how this DNA damage increases to levels in aging that it really leads to dysfunction and degeneration. We, we often looked at other animals as inspiration, like axolotls for re regeneration, whales and their ability to not have cancer. Is there anything that humans do in terms of aging that's better than what we see in the animal kingdom? Or are we about average? Well, I think we, we have, um, we, we, we should keep in mind that we are really in the on the trajectory of maxing out our human longevity. You have to imagine that in our traditional settings, up until 150 years ago, our life expectancy was mid-30s. You take out the uh, the high child mortality, it would be about uh, mid-40s then. And that was our life expectancy for, for thousands of years, probably. And now we've doubled that. Now, in, in just 150 years, we've doubled our life expectancy. And so all these diseases of aging we're really getting in this extra time that that we have gained nowadays because of our advances in our civilization right hygiene medicine all these better living conditions and so for the time that we usually we, we used to live we were actually pretty good but um now with this this doubling of life expectancy i think it's not unexpected that we're getting a, a variety of diseases and other species get the very same diseases when they just get old enough. Um, so uh, we have this with laboratory animals, for example, and mice that now live two, three years in the in the lab, while out in the wild, 90% of the mice die after six to eight months of their lives. So uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous extra that we have already. So we are already really privileged with the years that mm. we have. Um, and I think it's not very surprising. Our genetic makeup is just not made for these very extended lifespans we have nowadays. So in a way, we we already know that we can get some extra with, you know, if we live healthy, we do sports, we 
we you know uh, watch our caloric intake and all these things so we can we can even you know get a bit more out of it yeah i think even zoo animals like the ones in the wild versus in the zoo some of them are double the the besides turtles i think turtles are just beasts i don't know what takes them down besides like rats but uh like zoo animals will live a lot longer granted they they are sometimes very sad animals if you ever look at the predators they all have sadness in their eyes it makes like i like the everything that isn't a predator i I like it being in a zoo but predators i always feel like they have such sadness in their eyes and it, it makes me sad to look at them but uh is there uh with your so let we look uh 15 years in the future your therapy is out there it's affecting the population in a positive way uh how long do you think people will live if they were given it at birth like what roughly how long do you think people would live in addition if people live on average i think the average male is like 76 years old and i think the average female is like 84 somewhere around there um which women get the get a bump which is good for them but uh how long do you think the average what where do you think the average would go so that's a very very good question of course and i'm very eager to explore that how how much extra mm. particularly health span we can get i mean we're mm. not talking only about you know uh uh, a few more years of, of of life at the end. We're talking about health span and 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 uh, living a healthy long life. Um, and I'm very eager to see how much of that we can achieve with uh, you know with with improving DNA repair. I'm very confident that we will have we will see very beneficial effects um, uh, w- once we you know explore the entirety of how we can therapeutically apply this. Um, Currently, it's thought that there's a maximum human lifespan of uh, uh, about 120. Uh, I think there's good evidence, particularly epidemiological evidence, that this is actually really the case. And the biggest challenge is now filling this lifespan we have with health instead of disease. We have long disease periods at the end of our lives. Um, it's, est- it's thought it's on average like 13 years at the end of the life. On average, we spend uh, with with disease, with chronic diseases, and this is what we want to we, we want to tackle. This is what we want to to change. We want healthy aging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's one of the exciting things about your research is it doesn't it tackles both health span and lifespan. Sometimes people feel like it's going to be a trade off. I'll live longer, but I'll be sad, <laughs> sad, or uh, I'll be healthier, but I won't live. You know, potentially live the same amount or less. Um, if you were to take the nematode extension of life and apply it to humans, it would it would it like move it to like ninety, or would we get closer? Like how how much closer do you think we get to the one twenty? Yeah, I think this we really have to see once we have uh, uh, you know this therapy in in humans and see how exactly we can tweak it. I think this this would be a really um, uh, uh, very much out in the blue prediction as of now. Yeah. Um, so I think we have we we will have to do more research uh, to really um, you know get a very clear handle on that. So I wouldn't you know make make predictions here. Um, uh, we really have to have to take this step and develop it further and really see how can we get the best window of opportunity here. Are there is this will will this be a single therapy in terms of achieving let's say. The objective is get this out there, get us to the maximum health span, uh, health span lifespan of 120, where we're healthy and we cut down the the sick years to be like I don't know six months. Like you're healthy and then it's like uh, I don't know something happens and you're you're down. Um, is it is it will this be a single therapy that achieves that objective, or do you expect that we'll need other therapies addressing other issues to reach that effect? It is in, indeed conceivable that this could be a single therapy because. In human aging, DNA damage is such a fundamental cause and it interacts with so many other alterations in aging. I mean, all these so-called hallmarks of aging are really connected to DNA damage. And now DNA damage is so inevitably occurring that if we now repair it better and maintain the genome better and take out this driving force of the whole equation of all this complexity of aging, we could actually, with with uh, already with only targeting better genome maintenance that uh, this could already in itself make the decisive difference in keeping us healthy so that is indeed conceivable there there i'm um, picturing this poster it's like the the 
the it's like the, the life forms and how they're related to each other. It kind of looks like a tree trunk with a bunch of branches coming off. I wonder if you could if you if you would have something like that, but for your research and all the different diseases that we you currently know that it could affect. And if to, to the extent that you just have that like plastered on your wall when your scientists come in to inspire them, because the the significance of your research and and I mean the fact that the first couple of therapies are going to affect children, I think it's just uh, amazing. Anything that diseases affecting kids is uh, is pretty shitty. But uh, so I, I but um is, is that something that could be done where we could have like a like a like a I don't know like a food web or something that shows like all the different capacity for your research to affect uh, things? Is that like a a known entity or something that you guys have? Yeah, so indeed, I mean, we do do see that that this fundamental driving force from coming from the DNA damage affects so many different diseases. I mean, we see neurodegeneration, we see cardiovascular disease, we see um, we, we we see bone disease, we see muscle w- wasting. All these things we see when just DNA repair is not functioning properly. So mm-hmm. this is why we can link our our mechanisms of of improving DNA repair to so many different diseases, and that's what really excites us about this. Is there so there's hurdles in front of you, of course, of the ones that you see or that you suspect. Basically, what help do you need for the audience, for the people listening in? How can we help you forward so it's so we can get this sooner? I guess. Yeah, of course, it's really important that we find. Uh, uh, find uh, funding for developing this further. This is absolutely essential. I mean, we need to really make investments um, into really d- developing this um, to the real therapeutics. We have now put, based on our basic science, the groundwork for that, the concept, the conceptual breakthrough we've made. Now we need to take the next step. And for that, of course, um, we need uh, significant investments to really bring that into into therapies, into 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 molecules, drugs, um, and then um, uh, complete preclinical studies to really bring that towards the clinic and really make sure that we're not delaying that we can bring this to humans and to the benefit of human health. I think the Vita Dow does crowdsourcing. I think Lifespan does some crowdsourcing. I think it's been a couple of years since they do that. And I know Scent is like my favorite non uh, nonprofit in this space. Their tax returns are beautiful, and they communicate all their stuff real well. Uh, there are other organizations that get really angry if you ask for their tax returns. But uh, is there is there an opportunity for something like that for for you guys, or do you do you expect you'll partner with Scent to get grant money? Are you going to do like a crowdsourcing so people who are really excited can help you out? Like how how can like the average person basically be supportive? Yeah, I think these are very interesting uh, ideas, and and uh, we will certainly happy to talk uh, to organizations that facilitate also these, uh, you know, this participation of people who are enthusiastic and really want to invest on the right spot. Mm-hmm. I think uh, Michael Forrest, who whose episode is going up on this upcoming Tuesday, he did a crowdsourcing thing to raise to do his research, uh, and it was successful. So that's pretty cool. So there's definitely an, an appetite out there. The and I think Sens right now is looking for applications, so that might be a, a good use. But anyone listening in, if there's someone out there that would be really good to connect Bjorn with, if you just message me or like put in the comments, I'll I'll send it along. This research is incredibly important. Is there to get from uh, where it is now to the point where you could be at the point to translate it out? Is there an amount that is needed that is known? Is it you know like uh, I think um, Lisa from Sens said that. It's roughly like one to five million to complete out one of their branches of research. Is it roughly like that? Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. So for a phase two, so we are really in, in the phase now to complete preclinical uh, uh, studies, develop molecules, and and so it, it's 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 about the the, uh, in the in the ballpark of of about five million that we need to mm-hmm. really we really want to accelerate the research here, right? We don't want to go. Little by little, small step by small step, we really want to bring this forward. Um, and so, yeah, th- this is about what we would need for the first jump start here. Yeah, Jennifer Garrison was talking about how the funding models for research is really difficult because you'll get grants for specific things, but it's almost like when you, uh, 
Yeah, I picture when you eat sugar and your 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 blood, you know, your glucose spikes, and then you crash and you're tired for the rest of the day. Like you have to do all this different stuff just to try and maintain consistent research. And it's really it, it, it sounds incredibly complicated. I don't know how you how you how you manage to do it. And you know, maybe there needs to be like a master class for people who are gonna do what you're gonna do. <laughs> because it, it sounds like it's like not only are you doing your research, not only are you handling admin and all these other things, hiring great people, uh, but you're also spinning the plates of just making sure the grant money uh works out so that you don't have to like stop or throttle down or anything like that i think that's i think that's an element that was most that's been most surprising to me after the jennifer uh, garrison interview is to hear that you can't just be consistently working on something that you know is going to work you have to like kind of like twist it a little bit to make sure that the the funding can stay and you can keep going which i think jennifer is working on a new model yeah it's a constant challenge you know that you you finance your your um, uh, you know, your research and uh, there's way too little uh, blue skies research funding available. And also you need to sometimes have a, 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 a long breath, right? You, you, you cannot just do short term, you know, yeah. two, three, four years research. You need to be in for the long run. And for example, for the dream, we've really worked on that for, for uh, six, seven years now before we, we, we were completely ready because, you know, new concepts to develop, it's not just like a click. It, you know, you need to validate, you need to reproduce, you need to uh, really complete studies. And so you need, you need really money you can take for the big concepts and, you know, for the daring questions that you also need to have, uh, you know, um, to, to be able to fund this long term, it's very important. Uh, the thing that I found really weird, as you look at history, and we were talking about history before we got on the, uh, on the camera, but uh, the we used to we used to start projects that wouldn't finish for a hundred years. Like I think Notre Dame took like a hundred years. I think there's a, a, a another cathedral in Spain that's finishing up and it's been going for a hundred years. Mm -hmm. We used to really dream big, and now it's like, oh, you have a project for ten years like that. We, we're living longer. You think we'd have larger ambition? So I'm here in Cologne, the Cologne Cathedral, the world famous cathedral, mm -hmm. uh, took since 1248 to be built and was only finished in the 19th century. So wow. this is the long term vision for truly great things sometimes, you know, but we can be a bit faster for that because we're not building a cathedral, but um, I think it's important to realize that it that some things do need time to develop and we need to be have the you know have the perspective to really complete really daring and 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 transformative science. It, it's out, uh, uh, maybe a good idea is if your team is ever being like man this is taking a really long time you can just take them to that cathedral <laughs> And they'd be like, well, yeah. <laughs> it's not taking this long. <laughs> it can, can kind of like give them perspective, which is always fun to do. Um, for people who are, you know, becoming scientists, doing citizen science, or just trying to be more involved in this field, the roughly 25 to 35 year olds, they're in their first profession. They're looking for other ways to just give back and be a part of things. What advice would you give to the you know the scientist or the person listening in who wants to to do more and have a big impact on, on, on life i think it's really fabulous that now so many people come into the longevity field are excited about it and in different capacities i mean i think for you know a, a young student who is looking for the real big challenge in their lives I think aging research is really fits the bill because there are so many things you can explore. Um, and you, so you can engage yourself directly in research. If you're in other fields, technology development, even AI development, um, engineering, there's so many opportunities. In fact, engineering is actually a really interesting, um, you know, aspect of where you can, you know, um, build artificial tissues and things like that. Um, so they are also in finance. If you're in finance, why don't you try to promote the next big discoveries, the next big break, breakthroughs for human health, the ne next big biotech pharma industry that really takes on these new challenges? 
And I think there are so many opportunities, no matter wh what your background is, find a way to link your expertise um, with the scientific community, but also with the goal of improving human health and, and, and um, really tackle the issue of aging and age-related diseases. Over your life professionally, has there been advice that's been given to you that you realize in hindsight was not good advice that uh, you wouldn't mind sharing so that other people could avoid that, those minefields? Because sometimes people give advice and it's not good, but you don't know in the moment that it's not good. You only know after it's gone bad. Yeah, I, I think there's so much of that that, uh, you know, that you have so, you, you, you develop such a high level for frustration. And it's just part of it because there are, you know, so many things where you're disappointed, you know, you work all your, you know, you, you, you love a project so much and then you send off a paper and it, it's not even sent out by the editor, it's desk rejected, or you have reviewers who seem to not even have read the, the, uh, your, your damn manuscript. And, and this is really frustrating. And uh, I think this is something you're initially really unprepared for, how to deal with that. And I think it's really just an important part of it. And it's always the one thing that nobody tells you is that you are so privileged in doing something you really believe in that you you can live with you know frustrations and setbacks and all these things. And uh, because doing science, if you believe in that what you're doing is important, is a great privilege uh, to do. And you know, when if 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 you never fail, you haven't you haven't aimed high enough. So, you know, it's part of it. And uh, I th I think it's a challenge that you you are you are running into many situations as a scientist in your career development that you're completely unprepared for. You're completely unprepared. All of a sudden, you need to supervise people. No, you've never done that before. You've never been trained before on that, and you really need to learn a lot of things by doing. Um, and and so this unpreparedness, and then you know, adapt to the new situation. I think it's something really, really important. So you mentioned uh, machine learning and AI tools a minute ago, and one of our subscribers, um, Mark C. I know I don't know a lot to say your last name because I think this is your actual name. Uh, Mark C. wrote in and said, "Does Bjorn?" think the recent advances in AI will help to solve aging? And then he, he uh, is to some extent was just saying thank you for being on the show as well and for taking the time, which is uh, thank you, Mark, for that for that comment. Um, what do you think about AI and how, how is it going to affect aging? Yeah, I'm sure it will. It will uh, make a, a big contribution. I mean, uh, there are already examples where AI is actually, you know, taking part in, for example, um, uh, medical diagnostics and things like that. And I think with these recent advances that this AI field is really now, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it, it's been developing for quite some time actually, and now it seems to really explode. And so I think I really embrace the opportunities that we get with this. And I'm, I'm very eager to, you know, ex explore how this can really um, drive forward scientific discovery and uh, I think it, it will certainly play a major role also in, in science and technology. And that's exactly why I think it's so important that people from other disciplines come in and join us and, and really bring in their expertise, their perspective. Um, and you know, molecular biology as we know it, how was it jump-started in the first place? A physicist joined going into life science that has really transformed biology um, about 80 years ago. And now I think this is an ongoing process. And maybe now the new technologies that are coming in will yet again transform biology and make it even more productive and let us understand the, the, the miracles of life even better than we do nowadays. Is there a machine learning or tool out there that you're thinking about implementing in your research to help with uh, diagnostics or anything else you have going on? Or just something that you're on the, on the lookout for? Open I think up. it's something we are on the lookout. I mean, we're using, yeah. we do use a lot of computational, um, uh, um, uh, you know, approaches in our work already. 
but I think this this uh, we are very eager to see how AI can also expand this further. But it's on a very general note at the moment at this specific point. Yeah. If there, anyone knows any good tools out there that might be applicable to this research we're talking about, like you know, send it our way. But, so I, I believe Richard Dawkins, not Richard Dawkins, Richard Feynman, uh, different Richard, uh, uh, Dr. Feynman. People asked him like, if, if all of scientific knowledge was erased, what piece of knowledge would he keep uh, that would basically help restart it as fast as possible? And I think he said knowledge of the atom. What do you think, if you were put in that similar position, that you had to preserve one element of scientific knowledge, what, what would it be and why? The genome, because it contains the all the genes, controls all, all the information. It contains the, it's the blueprint for life, and that hmm. we should, we, we, we should, we should uh, keep in our understanding. Uh, what? Oh, wait. I uh, almost forgot. One of the other listeners uh, wrote a, a question. Yuda uh, Hasa... <laughs> U D H A. So you know who you are. I'll tag you. In his uh, last nature study, which I think came out last month around the fifteenth, uh, in his last nature study, they observed that the radiation doses used in worms induced embryonic lethality. But such doses are very rare in human exposures. How comparable to humans are the radiation doses used in worm studies? So um, the the importance of the radiation doses is what biological effect they have. And mm. so that's what is critical to compare. And so uh, it's very typical that the smaller the genome size of a species, that the higher the radiation doses are, but it's more complex even than that. So the importance is that with the doses that uh, we apply there, we get a survival, uh, a relative survival that is very comparable with very relevant types of genotoxic stress that we see in humans as well. And the important thing that we identified, we're using this radiation as a tool to induce DNA breaks and then investigate what consequences they have. And the really mm -hmm. groundbreaking finding we made was an observation we didn't, didn't believe this, this, this could exist before, that specifically DNA damage in mature spermatozoa leads to transgenerational lethality and genome instability in consecutive generations. And the types of new chromosomal aberrations that we get, these types that we get from the spermatozoa, from the, from the father's DNA damage, the same structural alterations in the chromosomes that we see in the offspring, are alterations we see in humans that invariably come from the father's DNA. And so that's where our results indicate that this is actually highly relevant for humans and for the, the specific risk factors of mutations that children might receive from, uh, uh, from, from their fathers. And uh, so that's why we think this is very important because we see the very same outcomes in humans. Um, and uh, so we can very specifically narrow down the critical time point that is when mature sperm is particularly vulnerable to DNA damage. And that seems to be very true in humans as well. And that is very relevant, for example, particularly when there's exposure during chemotherapy or during mm. um, uh, uh, any other environmental or work um, exposure to radiation, um, and so uh, there's particular protection should be uh, should be placed on this uh, on this period when mature sperm is um, is vulnerable and should not then be used for for conception. So the outcomes are very very similar in humans. Was the was the surprise that the previous paradigm was that it, they they couldn't be affected at all? They were just a part of the germline that was roughly immortal. Or what? What was the what was the shocking about it from your point of view? Yeah. So that the effect would be only visible in the next generation. Oh. So because normally you would have a direct effect in the embryos that they would die because they are damaged. But these embryos survive, they form new, hmm. uh, um, they form a whole new generation. And only after in the next, we see actually the lethality. That was 
fundamentally surprising. Oh, and then we see ongoing genome instability in the offspring. And so normally would have, would have expected that these damaged cells would all be long eliminated, but it's not. They grow up to whole animals. And that was completely surprising because then you get, you get rampant genome instability. And this we believe is very, can be very, could be very relevant in humans, for example, with disorders that are linked to mutations that occur in the germline of the parents. And here, for example, in humans, there are links to a neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism, um, where the biggest risk factor in, in, in fact is the age of the father. And with every year, also our germ cells accumulate mutations and that could be really a major culprit for that. And so we hope that our work can really shed some light into these mechanisms and could mitigate risks of, um, of, of germline mutations that could have detrimental effect in the children. Hmm. Yeah, it's going to be surprising because I would assume that it would just like terminate in uh, utero or like it would just reject itself. Yeah, when, normally when there's a mutation, because I, I think a, a lot of uh, miscarriages are like the the little fetus was growing in the wrong way. And so the body's like saying like this wouldn't survive. And so it stops it. Um, so it's, it's weird that there's not a corrective me mechanism that would like let some signal know that this needs to be uh, eliminated. So it wouldn't go on in that way. That That is really weird. Um, yeah, that is that was completely surprising because usually, yes, you would have a very effective, um, you know, the, the last uh, safety mechanism would be that that uh, the the embryos would would uh, die very very early on already, um, uh, and be shedded by natural mechanisms. Um, but here we see that even in humans, this stru this structural variants we call them, these are aberration in the chromosomes that we see that they are actually passed on to the children. Well, and um, would. Is it possible to regenerate them or to offer protection during that sensitive? So I'm thinking of so, this time in. Uh, no, go ahead. Yes. So what you what you would uh, try to do is really to um, uh, to um, allow the germ cells to fully regenerate from from their stem cells after genotoxic exposure. So, for example, during chemotherapy, mm. that uh, you uh, that. You, you that you can be also is certain that your your stem cells can produce correct um, genomically in uh, correct um, uh, a, a sperm again, um, but just don't uh, just don't use during um, uh, during the actual chemotherapy while it's going on and briefly thereafter. This should not be used. Um, uh, for conception, because that is when sperm is extremely vulnerable, because it's so compact in the in the mature sperm that it has no ability to repair the damage. Hmm. The um, I know we're coming then, so I want to tell you this cool uh, story similar to this about how uh, Kodak discovered that uh, that there were developing a nuclear bomb. But so the uh, what books would you recommend people check out? I know I think there's a neuro one. Nero one that I would actually like to check out, but what books would you recommend people check out and read? I'll read them all. They go on my shelf. These, this actually in all my books. So my my all time favorite book. I mean, this is not about aging, but it's the Eighth Day of Creation, which is an absolutely hmm. amazing book about molecular biology. It's so much fun to read, and it really gives you an idea how transformations in biology happen and and the people who make it uh, and and that's really one of one of my all-time favorite uh, favorite book in 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 biology um you mentioned already i think the selfish gene the fantastic book by richard dawkins uh, that i can also really absolutely recommend um so these are like really you know fundamental books that are also really fun to read actually Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the Richard Dawkins one, I, I can attest that he's a very uh, good writer, even if you disagree with some of his points. the, I mean, you can engage with it and he doesn't like obfuscate his feelings, which is good. Sometimes people uh, do that. So I, I like his writing. Um, 
the eighth day of creation. Alrighty then. Uh, I think that is. I just double check and running through real quick. Oh, where can people go to stay up to date with your work? I, I already said Twitter, but is there anything else? Do you have a newsletter? Do you have anything that you point people to? Uh, Twitter is great. Uh, check out our website for any updates. Um, uh, but I'm I'm usually uh, trying to keep up on on on, on Twitter, so uh, you can follow me there and uh, get some of the latest when the next paper is announced, the next preprint, or anything exciting happens. Sweet. And that'll be in the show notes. So I want to uh, thank everyone for listening, being a part of uh, the show. I mean, the comments, uh, as you can see, I like to uh, have people engaged. Remember to subscribe, comment, let us know what you thought of this. And, uh, you know, stay curious out there. That's the whole point. I think that the under- underlying thing of science is to be curious about the world around you. And Bjorn, I want to thank you very much for being on the show, sharing your research, answering some fan questions, and uh, doing your work. I, I-, I imagine there's going to be millions of people that are going to benefit from it. Thank you so much.